Pastor Mark sends his love. He couldn't be here. He's on the other side of the world today ministering at City Point, Bulgaria. If you didn't know, we are a church with many different locations. One of them happens to be in Bulgaria. So Pastor Mark is around there today. Uh, I love our child dedications. I love seeing families that stand up and say, I'm gonna raise my kid according to the Word of God. The Word of God is the most powerful thing for shaping a human life that I think exists. It's described as many things in the Bible. It's described as bread, that it gives us sustenance. It's described as a hammer, that it beats even rock and breaks you down. But one of the things it's described as is a mirror that often to know how you truly look in the day, you need to look in a mirror. You can see certain things about yourself. You can see certain things about the way you are dressed. But if you wanna see the true way that you look, you need a mirror. And the Bible is that. It shows us our true condition, how we truly are. And so it is my honour to bring the Word of God today. And I believe if you lean into it, the Word of God can transform you every single day you read it. If you come into this, knowing or thinking that you have it all together, that this Word has nothing for you, I guarantee you'll be correct. But if you come into today knowing that the Word of God could change you, I guarantee you'll be correct as well. So let's come around the Word of God today. Galatians chapter two is our key scripture. It's where we're camping for the day. And uh, Galatians chapter two is a story of how the Apostle Peter is getting in trouble again. He seems to get in trouble a lot. He uh, is in trouble for cutting people's ears off. He's in trouble for trying to stop Jesus going to the cross. And here, it's not Jesus getting up him, but Paul. And so we pick up the story in Galatians 2, chapter, uh, verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew. He separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Now, I'm gonna call these guys the conservative party moving forward because I don't really wanna say circumcision 12 times during my preach. <laughs> and uh, I, I often find this is a, a weird line to draw in the sand for, a, like most religious groups have a line they draw in the sand, like this is where salvation exists no matter if it's Christian or not. It can be enlightenment and nirvana, but, but these guys, this is the hill they wanna die on right there. That's, and, and so I'm gonna call them the conservative group. So amongst the Jewish people, there were different subgroups of people and these men from James were these real conservative Jewish people. And they came back after and seeing seen Peter eat with the Gentiles, they were coming to confront him. The rest of the Jews joined in Peter's hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, this is Paul speaking, I told Peter in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you, then you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? If you're saying that you can act this way, but you're saying to them they have to act that way, that's hypocrisy. Verses 15 to 19 is unpacking that statement, that hypocrisy that Peter was living out. And verse 20 says this, at the end of it, Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is what I'm camping around today. This is where, where I'm packing. And, and some context for this is that Peter himself was Jewish. The Jewish people believed up to that point that God was the God of Israel alone. That if you're a part of Israel, God was taking care of you. But Peter had this amazing revelation, this transformative moment of his understanding as he understood that Jesus didn't just come to save Israel, but came to save the world, all nations. He had this moment in Acts chapter 10. Where he was sitting on a roof and this vision happened a tablecloth descended from heaven and on it were all these animals that the Jewish people would deem unclean. Yet he was told three times, go, eat, kill, go, eat, kill. In essence, saying that the gospel, the good word of God, wasn't just for Israel and the Jewish people, but now should spread to all the people of the world who would receive it. That was the revelation that Peter got, this incredible revelation that everyone can have the good news of God, yet even with that, a revelation from heaven itself. He didn't act in line with that revelation, but instead, out of fear, 
acted in line with tradition instead of revelation. Now these people from James came along and he was scared of them and so he retreated from the revelation, retreated from that course of action which he knew to be right. And he knew it was good and he knew it was right and still he acted in a different way. You see, Peter was full of insecurity. And that's what insecurity does. Insecurity makes a person act differently than their core beliefs. Or say things that later they're like, I, I didn't really want to say that. There was pressure on my life that made me act or say things in a different way. And we saw this all throughout Peter's life. Even um, before Jesus died, Jesus taken to the cross and in the courtyard, they say to Peter, who said to Jesus just earlier at the Passover, I'll follow you anywhere. I will never deny you. In the courtyard, they say, Peter, weren't you with Jesus? No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. And so in that moment, these pressures from people he didn't even know, yet they made him act in a different way, speak in a different way, and Peter hated himself for it. He hated that he wasn't true to his core beliefs, what he truly said. And insecurity right now in our society is rampant. Not just that it works on a surface level, but it is one of the layers of foundation of our society, and we are seeing the fruit of insecurity at work. We have terms like the silent majority, that even though a people group all possess, the majority of the people possess a certain belief towards something, they would rather stay anonymous about it than speak into the loudest voice that could cast condemnation that way. We are a society that prioritizes empathy more, empathy, the feeling, I understand the hurt you're going through, I understand the pain you're going through, but empathy doesn't move them through it, compassion does. We have a society that prioritizes empathy over compassion. Compassion is the care for the person that sees them move through their pain into a greater future. Yet we have a society that says, no, just, just understand my pain, let me sit in my pain, let me stay there. We have a society that prioritizes understanding of self, the focus of self, rather than the commitment to others, which is ironic because the Bible says those that give a drink of water will themselves be watered. That in order to truly take care of yourself, you, you take care of others. And, and what society does, the patterns of the world are doing right now, it is coddling, it is embracing insecurity in people. And this happens on a society level and it happens on a personal level. And what it does when insecurity is a layer of your society's foundation, it means that the biggest victim wins. If your insecurity, if your hurt that you've been through is bigger than the person next to you, then you get more of the focus or remuneration or awareness. And, and we see this on a societal level playing out that those that put out the most noise or speak the loudest about their hurt their insecurity, their struggle, then policies, financial remuneration, awareness gets spread to that, even though it may not be the best course of action. And we see it personally as well, that the person with the loudest insecurity gets catered to. We see this instead of a person saying, I've got this situation, your system doesn't cater for it, I should change. We say, no, I'm dealing with this, you should change your system. This is what I'm dealing with, your school can't cater for it, can't cater for it change your school. This is what I'm dealing with, your workplace isn't came, change the workplace. And we have this society right now where insecurities are running rampant and society is catering for it. But I, I wanna make sure, do not allow insecurity to be a part of the foundation for your world because it creeps in. I, I see it creeping into marriages rampantly where husband and wife are competing for who's done the most around, who deserves the rest at the end of the day. You know, who's done them, who's contributing the most? This, this poor competition that really causes a downward spiral in relationships, all based out of insecurity. And so my message this morning is simply titled, Say Goodbye to Insecurity. Because Peter had a pattern of it. You can still be used by God, don't get me wrong. You look at Gideon, you look at Moses, all these people that had moments of insecurity. You can still be used by God, but it also bears a fruit in your life. While in a moment, insecurity's fruit might look good, over the long haul, it destroys you internally. And so Peter has this, and he hated himself for this insecurity. In Galatians 2, these men from James came to Peter and it says Peter was afraid of them. He was scared of them. And because of that fear, he acted different to who he truly was. Now, why was he scared of them? There are a few good reasons that we can have a look at. 
and we can guess, but these are probably just guesses based on the historical context. One, he was scared of violence, that these men from James were these really conserv- radical conservative people. And they may have been come because they were, he was preaching something different to they believe. They may have come and acted with violence towards him, taking him out. He could have been fearful of that. He may have been scared that he would now have to give a theological account to the Jerusalem church, which he was leading as to why he's neglecting Leviticus 11, which says, you know, don't break bread with Gentiles or people who aren't of uh, Jewish descent. He may have had to do that. Might be just, oh, don't wanna go through that. That's a huge overhaul, systemic overhaul. Don't wanna do that. But one of the major ones I think was, was possible is that he needed the backing of that conservative party that was coming against him in order to stay in power in the Jerusalem church. By the end of Acts, James was running the church not Peter, and so that might have been the case as well, that sometimes when you're holding something and it becomes part of your identity, if I have this, if I'm a leader in this, or this is my project and someone comes to take it away, I'll conform to what you demand of me if I can just keep this. And that might have been the insecurity working in Peter's life. But whatever the reason was, Peter dances to a different tune than he normally would have. He acts differently, behaves differently. And this is the hallmark of insecurity. It makes you do things you didn't wanna do, makes you say things that aren't true to what you truly believe in here and behave ways that later on you regret, regret, regret behaving. And although we naturally have a spiritually genetic sin disposition, that when we are born because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we're born into that, I think insecurity is more of a nurture thing than a nature thing more of our making and unmaking. You can make it, you can become more insecure and become more secure. In fact, the pattern of this world is currently to make people more insecure. Let me tell you what I, why I think that. A common example of this is the insecure overachiever. And this is what, how the Harvard Business Review uh, describes this. It says, There's a type of person, the insecure overachiever that many firms and businesses intentionally recruit and cultivate. Because organizations that are driven by the bottom line instill this culture that the only wins that matter are the wins of tomorrow. The only money that you bring, the only victories that happen the wins of tomorrow, and you are only as valuable to your colleagues and clients as the value and the achievements that you bring into the organization. Now, even in an environment like that, Insecurity is not something you're born with. It's something that's created around you. It's this culture that happens and you have to, to, for survivability, for survivability, you almost embrace this insecurity in order to make it in the company. There's different ways. We see the research that's been done around women and other minorities in professional settings. They make it clear that it's also a social issue, not just a professional one. And while studies show that women are constitutionally just as confident as men, there is this cocktail of conflicting messages around them. Be more assertive, but be less confrontational. But be authentic, but, don't, but be less emotional. There's all these different messages and how can you not second guess yourself with that? How can there not be insecure when all these messages are required of you? Even studies on insecurities in leaders right now. People who had this incredible drive. It used to be that the person had the incredible drive. It didn't matter if you stood on other people to get there. If you got it done, you were a great leader. But all the studies coming out now that overtly choleric leadership, those ones who are extremely driven, over the top driven, over the top harsh and erratic, are traits in emerging leaders, but not effective ones. Which means a lot of people who, who are at the start of leadership try and be this big driven thing, but people in longevity, you don't get the fruit from that kind of behavior. And whether it's in these social and professional settings or maybe it's in your life, it manifests in your life as you just putting thought bubbles over other people's heads. Oh, they're, they're thinking negatively about me. I saw them look twice my way. I wonder what, is there something on my shirt? Like, am I, am I looking weird? Or maybe it's gossip, talking about other people's lives. These insecurities, the world has a pattern of conforming you, almost like a funnel that it drops people in, conforming them to be insecure. But the Bible says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not be conformed to the way the world wants to mold you, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewal. 
This is at the heart of Christianity. Christianity in and of itself is not just a bunch of people in a room who think they have it right, telling the rest of the world we think they have it wrong. That is not the heart of Christianity at all. The heart of Christianity is people who have realized, who have humbled themselves enough to know that they cannot save themselves, that they need someone greater. Christianity in and of itself is people that have come into a place like this and who have realized that they are incredibly insecure and that they can't fix that themselves. They need someone greater. We need someone more. Christianity is not a new way to look or think of the world. It's a renewal of your mind. It's complete renewal. The way that we are all born, we are all born spiritually dead. This is what the Bible preaches, that when we are born because of what Adam and Eve done, we're born separate from God. God is the source of life. He's the source of spiritual life. How can anything disconnected from the source of life not wither and die, but how can anything not reconnected to the source of life not grow and flourish? Renewal is this grafting back into it. And so it's, Christianity is this renewal of all that we are. Now, Jesus is the model for this. Jesus was powerful, not just because he was the son of God, although obviously that helps. Jesus was not powerful just because he was without sin, but Jesus was powerful in all political and social situations because he was free. And free and secure are in the same boat. Let me tell you what I mean by that. There are so many identifiable pressures that seek to conform us as Christians to the ways of the world. Even just something so simple as you sharing your story, sharing your faith. If you were to do that maybe to a work colleague who has no background, they could be like, oh, he's, they're loopy. That's dumb. Why? That doesn't seem plausible at all. Maybe if, if you discipline your children this day and age, you can be called abusive. There's all these different pressures on the life to act in the Christian accord. There's pressures always trying to divide you from that. If you voted certain ways on different political situations, you can be seen as small-minded or outdated. If you don't agree with your boss, will you be passed up for promotion? There's always a pressure on your life to act a certain way in order to get to the goal that you think you wanna be. And this is what insecurity does, these pressures on your life. And Jesus had more pressure than any of us. He had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were not just minority groups. These were the leaders of that world at the time, the spiritual leaders of that world. And when Jesus would come and he'd do something great, he'd heal people and they would come in as the leaders and be like, well, you're healing on the Sabbath. What you're doing is wrong. Constantly undermining Jesus and what he was doing. And when they didn't come after Jesus, they came after his disciples. They threatened his disciples and said, and said if Jesus doesn't stop, We're gonna cause harm to you. Now, can you imagine this? Jesus' disciples weren't just, you know, his work colleagues. He journeyed with them. He lived with them. They were like, they were his best friends. They were like his family. Can you imagine if someone came to you and said, I know you're doing the work of God. I'm gonna take your family out if you continue to do that. And so often many of us be like, well, it's, we should take care of our families. Families first. But Jesus didn't model that. Jesus modeled, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness And all else will be taken care of. All else will be given to you. And and I think sometimes we are incredibly, incredibly good at rationalizing why our insecurities can stay in our life. We tie a Christianese bow around it. We put Christian language around it. But I am convinced of this. If you torture the scriptures, they'll confess to anything. If you put your own context around the Bible, you can make it say whatever you want and and justify whatever lifestyle you really wanna live. You can find a scripture and torture it and bend it. And we've seen that. People that read the same word of God believe in completely different doctrines. You don't know how they got there. And so you have to be careful that you aren't rationalizing why your insecurity could stay in your life because it'll do you more harm than good. I see people striving for likes and recognition on social media when they're afraid to have a real face-to-face relationship because face to face, for me to have a relationship with Dave, I have to let him know who I am. He has to know bad things about me in order for us to go close. If I'm on social media, there is a pathway for my insecurity to stay, but for me to be drip fed, the gratification of another like on my posts. The world has created ways for your insecurity to stay in your life. But Jesus had all these same pressures. And not even only from 
the Sadducees and Pharisees. He had it from his own camp. His own camp wanted to make him king. Jesus, you're awesome. Look at all you're doing. You're better than our rulers. Take this earthly position. And I wonder how many of us would say, wow, what a great open door from God. I wonder how much he could have achieved if he had the earthly position. He could reform the planet. Yet Jesus, time after time, refused. Even when Satan came and said, I will give you the whole world if you just kneel at my feet. Jesus constantly refused. And what was he doing? He was resisting these attempts, these manipulation attempts to attach him to a human agenda or a spiritual agenda. Jesus was staying free. No one could control Jesus. This is what made him so powerful in every situation, every social, every political. He stayed true and steadfast to God's specific will for him and the higher principles he lived by. No one could control Jesus because insecurities are like a lever that attaches, yourself to, attaches itself to your life. And someone else can get on the end of that lever and pull it and make you do things that you didn't wanna do. That's what insecurities does to a life. That's what we see in Peter here. He was someone who was supposed to take this new revelation that the gospel is for all the world, yet this one party, these men from James, pulled this lever and his insecurities make him dance to a different tune. And we all have these levers in our lives. I remember in, in grade 12, I, was, um, I did well academically in school and they had an award, I'm sure they still have it, which was the ducks of the school. Grade 12 came, I had no thoughts around that whatsoever. Until Graham Polkinghorne told me he wanted the ducks of the school. And then I wanted nothing more than being ducks of the school. And so I put the effort in and I eventually got it. But I didn't, get ducks to the school because someone who was smart got their achievements recognized. I got it because I wanted to be better than someone else. This insecurity within me, that, that insecure overachiever. And while in this situation, it bore a fruit that was good for my life, because insecurity can bear a fruit like we've seen in that Harvard Business Review. Overall, if that's applied to anything else in your life, you have this slow spiral down your... Can you imagine if I was like that with my team? That if ever... Dave tried to do something better than me, I would, I would shut it down. It caps a whole, it would cap the church, it would cap an organisation, it would, it would cap that. And imagine people in their own friendship groups doing that. No one in the friendship group can do better than you because you are insecure. No one else can speak about that. It's such a dangerous habit. What are your levers today? What are the levers that are on your life that people or situations can pull them and you dance for their tune? If you weren't loved well by your parents growing up, then approval is a huge lever in our society. People pleasing, you need the approval of someone else to do it. If you didn't have much growing up and you know what it's like to be, not have enough financially, then some people chase that their whole lives. They chase financial security their whole life. If they can just have enough, the house, the car, the everything, that they don't have to be scared all the time. That can be a lever that's pulled on your life. If you are praised for achieving, then maybe workaholic, workaholism is, is something that you, suffer from a lever of your life. We all have these levers, but, but Jesus had no levers. You couldn't make Jesus dance to any tune. You couldn't make him march to any drumbeat outside of that of the gospel. There was no way for the Pharisees or the Sadducees to align him with their agenda. And, and this is why he was always the most powerful person in any room that he walked into, because he was the freest. He was the most secure and for you to reach your God-given potential, you cannot be dancing on the puppet strings of insecurity. The most powerful person in the room is not the one with the greatest earthly position because there is a spiritual power that is higher than any power on earth. The most powerful person in the room is not the most well-liked or got the highest approval rating because even humanity's approval cannot buy you a ticket for heaven. No, the most powerful person in the room has always been the freest person. When you're in a meeting and no one else can form you to conform to someone else's agenda or personal crusade because you are only pulled by one lever and God has his hand on that, that you walk according to his potential, his plan and his purpose for your life. The world needs more secure people. And that wasn't Peter. So Paul confronts Peter. When I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, Security in Christ is the truth of the gospel. I withstood him to his face. And what's the solution here? Well, the theme of the month is the gospel. So 
if you can read into it, the gospel is the answer. But a lot of people don't turn that way for the solution for insecurity. Because one of the easiest things to do when you are insecure or someone has their hand on a lever of your life is to, is to try detachment. If I can be a bit more autonomous in the way that I act, if I can care a little bit less about what people think. And this is an entirely almost Buddhist approach. Try and make yourself this island because if those things can hurt me, if I can detach from caring about them, then they can no longer hurt me. Detach your heart from caring. That's a very Buddhist approach. You can be an island, but it's counterintuitive because most of the insecurities that humanity faces is because uh, stem from not having solid, meaningful relationships. And so that approach actually causes more insecurity. We are designed to belong. Belonging is one of the most foundational core tenets of what it means to be a human being. And so detachment, caring less, being impersonal, that is not an answer to insecurity. In, in fact, it'll enhance it in your life. No, verse 20, what Paul says, this is where we get to the, the true answer. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ who lives in me. Next, next week, we celebrate Baptism Sunday. There's three parts to every baptism that signifies three things that happen in a spiritual walk. When you go under the water, there's this death that happens to the old you. The Bible talks about the old you, an old creation, the one who was spiritually, genetically caught in sin. The, burial, the death of that person, the burial of that person under the water and then when you rise out, a new creation, resurrection with Christ. No longer you with the insecurities, with the sin, with the shame that lives, but now you walk in the fullness of Christ. That Jesus Christ on the, top, on the cross took what you were due so that you can walk in the freedom that he was due. He was a man who was without sin, without shame, without insecurity, completely secure. So how can we walk around secure? Because it's no longer us that walks around you may be able to be controlled, but Jesus Christ cannot be controlled. So you have to preach the cross to yourself every day. You can't outsource your faith. Jesus Christ is the author, the pioneer, and the finisher of your faith. But that whole gap in between, you gotta keep preaching the cross to yourself. You can't live off one meal at church a week. No one can live off that. You gotta preach the cross to yourself every day. The second part of the solution is this. I live by faith in the Son of God. I live by faith in Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me. I love this, that Paul often in his writings talks communal. He talks about the church as a group of people being the habitation of the Spirit. He writes all his letters to a group of people, but here he doesn't say, because Christ loved us. He says, because Christ loved me. Christ died for me. Paul gets really personal here. And he says, this is the solution to insecurity. It's, it's gotta be real to you. You have to have this deep conviction right down here, knowing that Jesus Christ didn't just die for humanity in general, but He died for you specifically. He loves you specifically. And if you just think of it as general, this will never shape your heart. It'll never transform your mind. It'll never renew you because you'll just see God as this theistic being out there in the universe somewhere. And He has this general love towards humanity, but He's not really concerned with the intricacies of my life. But you have to have this deep connection that when Jesus was on the cross, if it was you, the last person on earth, He still would have done it just to save you, just to be with you. And to the degree you have that revelation, it's the degree that insecurity starts to fall off your life, like scales falling off your life. Because when you look at the cross like this, let me show you how it works. Let me show you how you preach the cross to yourself. If you are a people pleaser, if you know that about yourself, and look, if you ask the people around you, they'll be able to tell you what your insecurities are. If you, if you are a people pleaser, you need the approval of humanity to feel good about yourself. Then you look at the cross, you look at a person that was so perfect, a person that knew you. Because a lot of the time people distance themselves from relationships because if people saw the real you, if they knew the thoughts that you'd had in private, if they knew the darkest parts of your life, that then maybe they wouldn't love you anymore. But here was Jesus who looks at you and he sees you 
all those parts. He sees the great things and he sees the terrible things. And he looks at you and he says, I love you anyway. I died for you anyway. What approval do you need from someone in a meeting when someone like that loves you like that? If you are a workaholic, if you're an overachiever, if you're someone that's been told that you need to do great things in order to be loved, then you look at what Jesus did on the cross being like, nothing that I can do can earn my way to heaven. There's no works that I could do enough. And Jesus on the cross says that even if I had not did not one good thing more, if I did gave up ministry, if I did not one thing else, he's still been like, come into my embrace. I love you, good and faithful servant. That for every achiever who gets their love from that, Jesus says, no, you don't work in order to get love. No, you are loved. Now go to work. The cross, that's how you preach the cross to yourself. Whenever that insecurity rises up within you, you look at what Jesus did on the cross. You look at how much He loves you, that He loved you and died for you. If I was gonna sum up this message in one line, it's, it's this. Insecurity destroys agency, but the gospel gives it back. Your agency, the power you have to make and outwork decisions for your own life. Insecurity takes this. And this is what I'm seeing in society so much right now. People are where they are. They know they've made choices along the way, but still they don't feel in control of their own lives to be there. They feel like this is all forced on them, that there's levers pulling their lives to get them to the place that they're at, not fully in control. Insecurity destroys agency because you're always dancing to the tune of someone else. But the gospel, the gospel gives it back. It cuts the chains off your life. It allows you to make decisions again in truth and in love. The world needs more secure people to move forward, to take society forward, to take your life forward, take your family forward. We need to be secure people who can't be swayed but run their race with love, who fulfill the call of God on their lives and who change their world for good and for God. Let me pray as we close today. God, I thank you for the gospel. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice that what you did on the cross wasn't just saving our soul, but you transform our mind with the revelation of it. God, I speak to the insecurities in people's lives today. And God, I ask you to shine the truth of your gospel on it. Show them how fake it is, Lord God, and show them the truth and the realness of who you are. God, I pray for this church, that we be a church of secure people, a church not afraid or not swayed by the influences of other people, but can stand in the truth of your love and your gospel. And for people in this room today, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, people in this room today who don't know you yet, God, I wanna pray for them in just a moment. This morning, maybe that is you, you are insecurity plagues your life because you don't have the security of Jesus. You don't have Him in your life. You've never made the choice to follow Him. Or maybe maybe you kind of like the way this all sounds, the Christian thing, but you haven't had that spiritual renewal, that spiritual rebirth, just deciding to follow Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, not just to follow His ways or subscribe to church like you do any other YouTube page or whatever it may be. No, Jesus came to be your Savior and your Lord You lay down your life, like in baptism, you lay down the old you dies and a new you is reborn, a new you that walks in the fruit of the Spirit with goodness and love and peace and joy and patience. That is how you are to live life as a new creation in God. It starts with one decision, to follow Jesus Christ, to know Him. Do you know Him? Do you know He loves you? Do you know He died for you? If you need that today, if you need to make that decision today, on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand And I'm gonna pray with you and God's gonna do a miracle in your heart. One, if that's you today, something could be resonating inside you. The Holy Spirit says we don't need anyone to teach us, but He will make known His truths. That right now, as I've been speaking, something's been resonating in your heart that this is for you. Two, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've gone, how much you've deviated from this. It doesn't matter if you've made this decision before, this decision is the most important one that you can make. If you need to make a decision to follow Jesus, one, two, 
three. Just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with is in this place. Thank you, thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, amazing, see that hand. Thank you at the back, great decision. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every hand that was lifted, the ones that I saw and any that I didn't, but you saw every heart that turned. That's what repentance is, turning back to you. And God, you say that when we make a decision to believe in our heart and confess with our mouths that you are God, that we will be saved, saved out of a life of insecurity and saved into a world of secure peace, joy, promise, purpose. And God, I thank you that salvation has come to hearts in this room today. In the name of Jesus, we all said, amen and amen. Amazing decision. Put our hands together for all those decisions today. Great decisions, great decisions. If you're one of those people who made a decision today, this is just the beginning. You follow Jesus for yourself, but don't follow Him by yourself. We call us a church family for a reason. And so there's some steps that we would love for you to take as you take your next step closer to God, as we all do. Keep coming to church. If you haven't been baptised yet in water or the Holy Spirit, next Sunday is for you. You can join a life group. Find a small group of people that meet week in, week out, who pray together, believe together, share food together, have a good time together. And uh, if you haven't started growth track yet or do growth track, you should really do that. Discover who we are as a church, what your spiritual gifts are. Have the, the prayer team come in and prophesy over your life, pulling some of the gems of God out of there. Make sure you sign up for growth track. Um, but importantly, also tell somebody. The most important things you do is tell someone, say, hey, I made this decision. I'm not sure what it all means yet, but I'd like to find out. Let's put our hands together again for salvation in this house. Great decisions. Great decisions. Well, that's all from me today. Pastor Ruben's gonna come and close the service, but have a great week, City Point. Thank you, Pastor Chris, for that phenomenal word. Amazing, what a great word. I just found out today that Pastor Chris got the ducks in his school. What a clever man. Must be nice, eh? The ducks in his school. Um, hey, we're gonna come around a time of giving this morning and the different ways of giving on the screen behind me. Uh, we have the QR codes in front of us, the buckets will be going around and we have the giving stations on the back or online, whatever way is easiest for you. Uh, but I love this scripture here in Luke and it says this. It's coming, I promise. Luke 6.38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And let me tell you something this morning, church. I, I love to cook. I, I love to cook. And, and there are moments when we won't have anything in the fridge, and Mel's like, babe, like, we got to get takeout tonight because we got nothing in the fridge. We got nothing in the pantry. And I'm like, what do you mean? We are surely, like, we have something. And she's like, oh, she, she might say, oh, we have chicken in the freezer and some rice. I'm like, great, I can work with that. Perfect, I can do something with that. She's like, oh, as if I'm like, watch me. And I, I get that chicken and I start like getting the seasoning from the cupboard. I'll get like spices and herbs and put them on this chicken to make the flavors pop. I'll start cooking that chicken down real low because we don't want that dry, dry chicken. Dry chicken's from the devil. We want juicy chicken. So I'll cook it from the, like a low temperature and bring that bad boy up. And then I'll start reducing the sauce and then I'll put that chicken on the rice and then, and then drizzle the sauce over. And without fail, every time Mel's like, how did you make this from a couple of ingredients like that? And um, I've got some good news this morning, church, is that God also likes to cook. He likes to cook, and when we give Him ingredients, man, He makes something beautiful out of it, like better than any Michelin star chef out there. In other words, when we release to God, He does something with that. When we release our seed to God, He does something supernatural. When we release our faith, He does something supernatural with that. When we release our prayers, He does something supernatural with that. And in the same way, when we release our finances, he also does something supernatural with that. Is that it's so much better in His hands than it is in our hands. And I know that a lot of us are probably praying, God, we just want to see the miraculous. We want to see the 5,000 fed, but we're holding on to our fish and we're holding on to our bread. And God's just saying, would you partner with me? Would you release that in faith so we can see the miraculous take place? So I want to really shut our eyes this morning. 
Let me pray. God, I just thank you so much that, Lord, you were first generous with us, God. We thank you that as we sow a seed, no matter the size of the seed, you are the one who brings increase, Father. So, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you will breathe upon it, Father, that you will multiply it, and you'll do so much greater than we ever could have imagined, Jesus. God, we thank you for Brisbane, the city of God. Father, we love you in Jesus' mighty name. We all said amen and amen. The buckets are coming around, and we're going to throw our eyes to the screen and see what's coming up in the life of our church. Well, Easter is upon us. And honestly, it's the hallmark weekend of our spiritual year. It's the the time we set aside and we celebrate, we remember the greatest event in human history, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of that event, uh, we're here as believers in Christ with eternity in our future. Uh, It's such an important weekend and the story needs to be told. So many people don't know uh, what we celebrate Easter about. So make sure you don't come alone. Bring your family, invite your friends, your neighbours, your workmates. It's going to be an incredible time. And to make sure you know where and where, go to the website, find your nearest City Point location, find out what times Good Friday services are going to be, and then again on Sunday. Let's celebrate Easter together powerfully. publicly say that I'm giving my life to God and like God gave 100% of him to me and I want to give 100% of myself to God. I've seen God move through my family in our hardest times during my husband's cancer. He's given us the peace and strength and I just want to give him all the glory. Um, I just decided that I want to go all in with God and that I want to let go of my old self and see what God has for me in His will and His glory. Amazing. Baptism Sunday is next Sunday. And um, I love Baptism Sunday. I always get so excited. Um, when Pastor Chris was talking about it before, I was getting so pumped up. And um, you, you better hope that I'm not in that tank with you if you're being baptized next week. Because I get sometimes too excited and I, I hold you down for a little bit longer, that little bit extra, because that old you got to go. That's not staying around. Um, I'll hold you down until those bubbles start coming out. I'm, I'm joking. But... I love it so much. And, and the moment that your nose breaks through that surface and you come up in your new creation in Christ Jesus is so powerful. That's the gospel right there, right? Bringing dead things back to life. Um, so we have that next weekend. We have, um, <laughs> we've got still laughter over here. <laughs> we got um, the water baptisms outside on the green and that's after the 10, 15 and the 5 p.m. And then we have Holy Spirit baptisms on the side of stage here um, after the 8.30, the 10.15 and the 5 p.m. And if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, um, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. Come and do that. Come and be filled with the Holy Spirit because God wants to move powerfully um, through our lives as we outwalk this walk that He has called us to um, do. And we also have Easter coming up. And Easter will be, we'll have a 9 a.m. service on the Good Friday that goes for one hour. And we also have a 9 a.m. service on the Sunday and a 5 p.m. service as well. But hey, we get to come together as a family and we get to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's like the pinnacle of our faith right there. And I heard that at the 10.15, there is an Easter egg hunt for all the adults um, I mean, for all the kids, I saw all your adults' eyes lighting up like Easter egg hunt. Let's go. I know we can take those Easter eggs off the kids once we get home. That's that's the idea there. But um, that's also happening. So invite your family, invite your friends, um, and we also have SWB for all the ladies just around the corner. Um, I love what the youth guys said last week. They were so crack up. They said, guys, if you want to get rid of the girls for the weekend, get them a rego for SWB. But um, it, it's always a powerful weekend, and, and um, part-time regos have just opened up, and you can get that in the foyer there. But hey, church, that's all from me. Why don't we all be upstanding? We're going to go out praising the King of kings and the Lord of the lords because He is good, He is faithful. Is a lamp unto my feet. Your way. 
Sunday. God bless.